Hi there. I am inside of a Jupyter notebook, and I have a little script over here that tries to compare the linear regression model with a ridge regression model. The script, as we'll see in a bit, is designed in a way to also throw you off a little bit. Now, before going in depth, let's first discuss what we're actually doing. We are going to be doing a regression task based on some simulated data that comes out of scikit-learn. There is a make regression function over here, and this is going to generate a data set, a XY pair to be precise, that you should be able to model perfectly if you are using a linear model. And that's what we're actually doing. I have a linear regression model over here, as well as a ridge regression model. So I have a for loop over here that's going to loop over both of these two models. I'm going to uh, do the fit predict thing inside of scikit-learn. That gives me some predictions. And then I'm going to calculate the mean absolute error. I'm going to be comparing my predictions with my y variables. And when I do that, you see these results down below here. If you're somewhat experienced, you should immediately be triggered by seeing this error metric over here that is just so dang small. This is a very, very small number, e to the power minus 13. This is practically zero. So this is a model that's reporting zero error. That is a pretty big code smell, unless you realize that we are, of course, reporting on the train error over here. And that's not going to be representative of a practical use case. Instead, it would be a lot better if we were to report on the cross-validation error instead. So let's also do that. I am going to uncomment this line of code, and that will also allow us to see these cross-validation scores that we're also calculating. The main thinking here is that we are going to be making lots of train and test sets, and that we are going to be reporting on the mean of all these different test sets. And this number should be more representative uh, than the train score. Now, before going in depth here, there is one observation that I would like to make. We are looking at the mean of the cross-validation results below here. So this is the cross-validation result for the linear regression model, and this is the cross-validation result for the ridge regression model. If we were only to look at these cross-validation numbers, then we might be missing out that we have a linear regression model that can perfectly fit onto the data. So even though looking at cross-validation numbers is in general a good practice, it might still always be a good idea to also look at the train numbers just to see if something suspicious is happening. If there is ever a perfect fit in a train set anywhere, that is something you would like to see. That said, there is also something else that we just maybe want to observe here. And that is the fact that this make regression function really isn't generating a whole lot of data. It really only seems to be generating 100 data samples. And that might not be super realistic, so let's actually generate a bit more data. 2,000 data points ought to do it. So we now see some behavior that I think is more in line with what I would expect when I train models on data sets. However, out of these two models, even though they seem to have similar performance, in general, I would recommend using the ridge regression. And from now on in the video, I would like to try to explain why. One reason is pretty easy to simulate. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take one data point from the labeled set, and I'm just going to inflate it set it to a pretty high number that's not representative of anything else in that data set. If I were now to rerun this script, and let's also reduce the number of samples just to make uh, the effect here really pronounced. When I now start looking at these cross-validation results, then we start seeing a more pronounced difference. This ridge regression, even though it is a linear model, is doing something internally that makes it more robust against uh, these outliers, so to say. So that's an interesting effect, but now might be a good time to also start explaining what this ridge regression is doing internally. Because it's still definitely a linear model, but it's a linear model that does something extra that causes behavior that we might like. Now, before diving in depth in what a ridge regression does, it might help to also remind ourselves of what a normal linear regression might do. So, just to whiteboard a bit, uh, the way it works inside of scikit-learn is that you're typically dealing with this data set X. This would be an array with lots of numbers. You would typically have N rows and you would have K columns. And then you're also dealing with this vector Y that represents the stuff that you would like to predict. This would be N rows, but it would only be one column. And this might be house prices or whatever the regression task you've got. Uh, that's what we're trying to predict here. Then what does linear regression do? Well, 
linear regression basically says for every single column that we have in X, let's multiply it by some sort of weight. And just a notational note, uh, whenever I write X1 here, that is of course referring to an array. I'm referring to a column from the original matrix, so to say. So just to write that down slightly differently, uh, I am dealing of course here with arrays, but just to make that just a little bit more emphasized, I'm going to use this notation to really indicate that I'm not dealing with a single data point here. I'm dealing with columns. Then uh, I might also have a constant that I'll be adding here that usually adds for a good fit. But uh, the hope is of course that we are going to be finding these weights such that the approximation that we've got here eventually really starts to look like Y. And this is what a linear regression does. It's really just about finding these uh, weights that have a linear relationship with the input data. And hopefully that'll allow us to really get a good approximation. So far, the ridge regression is actually the same as the linear regression. The ridge regression will also be looking for these weights. That's exactly the same as before. But what the ridge regression does differently is the ridge regression has a opinion about these weights. The ridge regression is saying, well, these weights, they can't be too big. The concern at play here is that there is a risk of overfitting on our data unless we do something to counter it. So the way that this would work inside of a rich regression is they're basically saying you have a thing you want to optimize. And just for quick notation, I'm going to be saying, take the matrix X, multiply that by some array of weights, subtract from that the Y values. And uh, this kind of feels like something you want to uh, minimize, let's say. But what we're also going to be minimizing is just some sort of measure over all of these weights uh, which mathematically people like to call the norm. But the whole point of a ridge regression is that this extra bit of a cost is being taken into account. We're not just interested in finding the perfect weights, we are interested in finding the weights that fit very well and aren't too big. It's this addition to the cost function that makes a ridge regression a ridge regression. Now to make this system a bit more tunable, what you'll typically find is that there's some sort of a alpha parameter that is a hyperparameter you can add to the system. Because you can imagine that we also don't want to regularize these weights too much. There might be very good reasons to have a weight that is a very large value if it makes the prediction very good. But then this alpha can be seen as a hyperparameter that also carries a interpretation. The amount of regularization, the amount of punishment we give these large W values, that is something that we can go ahead and tune. Hopefully with this bit of context, you can also start to think about the difference. If we have a model that only looks at this bit, or if we have a model that takes this entire picture into account, then hopefully you might also get an impression of what behavior is to be expected. This can definitely overfit the data more. On the other hand, if we have a counterbalance on the weights, then there's also a bit of risk that we underfit. But we will be more robust against things like outliers, but also data sets are a little bit different than what we see in training. You could argue that maybe we have better test set performance if we don't overfit. There is of course always a balance though. There's a risk of overfitting, sure, but there's also a risk of underfitting. And the way that you typically would tune that is by tuning this alpha parameter. So going back to the notebook, I figured I might give a very quick demo of what the alpha parameter might do. I have my ridge regression and what I'm doing is I'm fitting over the same data set again and again, but with different alpha values as a hyperparameter. To make the visualization work just a bit nicer, I am also not training for an intercept over here. But when I do this, and if I were to make the plot, then you can see that for the same data set, if I have a different alpha value, then I also have different weights for the regression that are being calculated. For very low values of alpha, you can see that there's not much of a change. But there does come a time when I increase the alpha value more and more and more that they all start moving down to zero. And while this chart gives a pretty good intuition of what the coefficients do, you can also make a similar chart, but showing the model performance against an actual data set, which I've also done below. The data set that I'll be looking at is a data set with car prices. So you can imagine there's different uh, brands, there's different types of cars, uh, there are different colors of cars, there's different types of interiors, etc. 
But the thing that we would like to predict is the eventual uh, selling price. And I believe that these are all uh, secondhand cars that got sold. So just as a quick demo, uh, I am grabbing a couple of columns from the data frame. I'm also grabbing the selling price as the thing I would like to predict. Then I am building a pretty straightforward model using the table factorizer from Scrub. And then down below over here, you can see that I'm doing a grid search where I'm really just looking at the alpha value of the ridge regression. And one thing to note is that I am using NP log space over here. Uh, and we'll see later in a bit why uh, this might actually be useful. It turns out that the hyperparameter is pretty sensitive, so it helps to uh, not do this in linear space, but to do this in log space. And once you start letting it run, then this is what the results look like. If the value for alpha is quite small, then you can see that the mean absolute error just is pretty high. Only when we push for somewhat larger values of alpha, then we actually see the mean absolute error go down. And it's this why quite typically a linear regression model will not be as performant as a ridge regression. There's something about that overfitting and underfitting phenomenon where it can be a good idea to basically always resort to ridge. When you look at the train set performance, then a logistic regression can easily beat ridge because ridge will be underfitting in that domain. But once you start doing proper cross-validation and when you actually tune for the alpha parameter, the ridge regression typically always outperforms the linear model simply because it is able to not overfit on the train set as much. In general, whenever you're dealing with a model that has a regularization parameter, I do advise to take hyperparameter search serious. There might be a precision or recall balance and there are all sorts of effects that you do want to confirm with your metrics. But I do hope it's clear that regularization parameters tend to be great because they can prevent some overfitting from happening. That's true for Ridge, but it's also true for other models that have a regularization parameter that you can tune. That said, I guess one of the main things about the Ridge regression that's pretty cool is that it's really just an adaptation to the loss function, the thing that we are optimizing in our linear system. And that's an interesting phenomenon in general, because there are also other things that we can do to adapt the loss function to make the machine learning pipeline fit to the application that we're interested in. And I'll be exploring this phenomenon in upcoming videos in a small series.